Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Founded in 1976 by 13 visionary women leaders, CMC's mission is to connect people and ideas through community conversation. To carry out its mission, CMC explores public policy issues, current events, and lessons in leaderships at forums like this one every week. From its beginning, CMC has welcomed everyone. I'm Doug Buchanan, Editor-in-Chief of Columbus Business First. I'm also a member of the CMC Board of Trustees and a chair of the program committee. Uh, for those of you who might not know, CMC's program committee is our editorial board. We meet every month here in this room to help CMC decide which of the many ideas we receive for forums become reality. If you're interested in knowing more about this process, you can speak to me about it or the other Doug Buchanan uh, right over there. Uh, strangely enough, he's also uh, the program uh, committee uh, person. So uh, you've got the power, power of two Doug Buchanans at your disposal uh, at any time. So you can talk to us, either one of us. I am pleased that you are with us here uh, for today's forum because this is the last one we are having at the Audubon Center before we move to our new home next week, the Ellis on 4th Street in Italian Village. Very exciting venue, uh, and uh, I hope to see you all there uh, next week as well. We're going to welcome our newest members. We have Haley Akko with the Health Policy Institute of Ohio, and Michelle Lindeboom and Vivian Turner with Franklin County Job and Family Services. Let's have a hand for our newest members. Welcome. What does it take to become a member of CMC? You don't need to be rich, well-connected, or run your own newspaper. You just need to visit columbusmetroclub.org and sign up. It's a very easy process. Uh, you can also speak to one of the CMC staff here. Uh, either way, you get to trade in your red name tag for the much more aesthetically pleasing green one, and that is worth quite a lot. Uh, you can scan the QR codes at your table and you'll see the many generous organizations that support your not-for-profit Columbus Metropolitan Club. We could not exist without their support. So let's thank today's sponsor, Carlisle Patchen and Murray at the table up front here. Uh, thank you very much. We're also grateful to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting today's live stream, which is being carried on CMC's social media platforms. Thank you also to the Grange Insurance Autobahn Center for hosting us this final time. Let's have a hand for all of our supporters. Okay, on to the program. As Ohio's 49th Treasurer of State, Robert Sprague is the Chief Investment Officer for our state's investment and debt portfolios. He's a Finley native and has made a career in Ohio politics, serving in the Ohio House from 2011 through 2018 before being elected state treasurer. With a reproductive rights amendment, a statute to legalize marijuana headed both to the ballot in November, Ohio politics are headed in an uncertain direction. Today we dive into the present and future of Ohio's political climate. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Robert Sprague, Ohio's 49th Treasurer of State. <laughs> and our host making a triumphant return to CMC, the one and only Karen Kassler, Chief, Bureau Chief for the State House News Bureau. <laughs> Check out the QR codes on your desk for more information about both. Karen, take it away. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you to Treasurer Sprague for being here. This is the last forum at this location. So let's let's have fun. Let's send right. it out with a bang. All, all right. right. That's good. All right. So you all will have quite an opportunity to ask questions here in a bit, but I'll, I'll start it off here. So let's begin at the beginning for you when it comes to your public service. You were the city auditor and treasurer of Finley. Then you ended up in the state legislature. You were appointed and then you ran. Why did you want to make that move, which arguably would require you to spend less time at home? Well, yes, that's probably true, Karen. Maybe that says something a little bit about home uh, for me. <laughs> Uh, we do have five children. My wife, Amanda, and I reside in Finley with our five kids. And uh, we have a very busy schedule as a family, as you can imagine. Our oldest two are in college at this point. My oldest is at the Citadel down in South Carolina and is intending to pursue a career in the United States Army and serve his country afterwards. Uh, Davis is at Miami. I don't know if we have any Miami grads. Okay, all right, there we go. <laughs> Love and honor, right? All right. And then the other three are still at home. Uh, but the reason that I, I decided that I wanted to go down to the state house was, uh, you know, I 
have this financial background. So I have my MBA from the University of North Carolina. And then I went to work and I worked at Ernst & Young as a management consultant. And I worked overseas in Hong Kong and Singapore. I led a project over there for about a year. Uh, and when I came back to my community of Finlay, um, I wanted to use some of those problem solving abilities that I had learned in the private sector and in the business world and try to apply them to help my community. And so I had this financial background. I thought I could do something for the city treasury. That worked out fine. And then I became city auditor and something terrible happened. Uh, I was, uh, became the city auditor and six months later, uh, my little city of Finley, Ohio had a 100 year natural disaster. We had a flood, uh, which has been an ongoing problem in Finley for a long period of time. And so we recovered from that. Um, and then we immediately ran into a problem. Our largest employer in Finley, I don't know, you're probably not familiar with Cooper Tire and Rubber Company. Anybody buy Cooper Tires? They are fantastic tires, by the way. Not, not that we don't like Goodyear Tires, but Cooper Tires are fantastic. And Cooper is the largest employer in Finley. And uh, Cooper actually threatened to shut down the Finley plant. They were gonna shut down one of their four plants in the United States. So that was my start at, as auditor. And I guess the reason I'm telling you that backstory was was then when we kind of got through that crisis, uh, the state had an $8 billion budget deficit. And so I have this financial background, I've served at the local level and helped balance the budget during some very difficult times. And I went over to talk to my mother and I said, Mom, I'm thinking about running for the state house. And she said, Robert, why would you want to do that? She said, the state has an $8 billion budget deficit. And I said, well, because mom, if you know that the state has an $8 billion budget deficit, then surely everybody else does as well. And I think we're gonna be able to do something about that. So that was my reason for coming down to Columbus initially. I really wanted to, to help the state. I wanted to be the finance guy for the state and, and help balance the budget. You were first appointed to the legislature in 2011 when Republicans had just taken control of the House back from the Democrats who had been in charge for two years. And that year of 2010, which you were appointed right after that, had been a sweep of Republicans into office. In 2018, you were term limited uh, out of the House. You could have gone to the Senate. What made you make the move to go into the treasurer's race? Well, you know, I believe that finance matters, and I think that uh, financial responsibility for the state is very important as we look at our finances and we look at our budget, and I felt like I could make a difference in the treasurer's office. Uh, and when we first got in, we, we took a look at, we wanted to define a mission for the treasurer's office. And I know that, I'm not gonna talk about debits and credits because I know everybody's eyes will float into the back of their head, but this stuff matters. We just most recently, for the state of Ohio, we actually received an upgrade on our credit rating. Now, for those of you that, that don't know, um, you know, the credit rating is essentially the ability for us to repay our bonds in the future. And why that's important is not just because it's a credit rating, but it really indicates the financial health, the long-term financial health of the state of Ohio. And I don't know if you saw this news story. Now, if you're, if you're reading the Capital Connection, I'm sure that you did see it because I know that Karen has covered it but the state received an upgrade last year on its credit rating from AA plus to AAA. AAA is the highest by Fitch Credit Rating Agency. And as a matter of fact, our credit rating now as a state in terms of our long-term fiscal health actually exceeds that of the United States government. So the government was downgraded to AA plus this summer. The state of Ohio was upgraded last summer to AAA. We now exceed in terms of our financial health that of the United States government. So, you know, my thought was when I was running for the treasurer's office, finance matters, how we budget matters. Uh, I felt that was very important that we take a conservative, you know, very realistic, when I say conservative, what I mean is picking a, a low number for your revenue projections, you know, trying to make sure that you budget all of your expenses in case you have any, any problems, you know, doing a good job with your budgeting and that has paid off over the last decade, that solid, fiscal leadership, uh, and it's resulted in outside vindication that says the health and the future of the state of Ohio is very, very bright, and, and it's, we have a great financial foundation. So that was why I wanted to, to serve in the treasurer's office. I thought that I could help with that. So you were taking on an office that is, sadly, largely ignored. <laughs> it's the treasurer's office. We're here to try to enlighten people a little bit on what happens in the treasurer's office. It had been held previously by Josh Mandel, who did a lot to attract attention. He had a 
bitter campaign against Kevin Boyce in 2009. He started OhioCheckbook.com, did a lot of press conferences with local officials, transparency advocates, people who were on the other side of the political aisle from him. But there was also some questionable travel, some spending state funds that people were asking about whether that was related to his political ambitions. So you arrive in the treasurer's office. Do you feel like you have your work cut out for you? Did you feel like you had a lot of work to do to restore confidence in the office? Well, when I became treasurer, I, the first thing I wanted to do with our senior staff was, you know, I think that leadership comes down to kind of four key elements. Uh, and one of the key elements is everybody has to be on the same page in terms of what you're going to accomplish. And we created a mission statement within the treasurer's office within my first three weeks there with our senior staff members. Uh, and our mission is very simple. Uh, it's that we want to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars, number one. Number two, we want to be bold innovators for the people of the state of Ohio. And number three, we want to be wise investors in the future of our state. And then our mission and everything we do in the treasurer's office somehow relates back to that three-pronged mission statement. And so when we talk, for instance, about good stewardship, one of the very small things that we had when we came into the office is we needed to make sure that we had good professionals that were working in the treasurer's office. And so we really made a commitment to hiring talented individuals, talented professionals in the treasurer's office. And you may go, well, why does this matter? Well, one of the things we did was we have uh, created, in my opinion, a world-class trading desk in our investment department. And we actually extend to our local governments the ability to utilize our trading desk through our local government investment pool. So if you're the city of Columbus or uh, you're Commissioner Miller, up uh, in Northwest Ohio, whether it's the funds of the county or the funds of the city or a township, you can benefit from the expertise that we have hired on our trading desk by investing in our Star Ohio account. And if you look at it, it's a great liquidity uh, tool for our county commissioners and our county treasurers. They can get money out of it the same day or next day, and yet it has some of the highest interest rates that you can earn uh, for short-term money in the state of Ohio. It's because we, and all that matters because we have hired talented people on our trading desk that are doing a great job. Um, so I guess for me, it wasn't about really what my predecessor did. For me, it was about what I wanted to accomplish and how I felt the office should be run. And we continue this day to be a very mission-driven organization and everything that we do, and you'll hear me talk about that today, and we talk about it a lot internally, relates back to our mission. Let's talk a little bit about some of the things that your office does. Specifically, what would you say is the biggest accomplishment, the biggest thing that you're proud of in the treasurer's office in terms of a program? You know, I'm a proud of a lot of programs that are, you know, they kind of tend to be the, the bright, shiny things that we roll out because they're newsworthy and they're new. But I think that one of the things that I'm most proud of is the fact that our internal operations are so solid. And you don't hear about, you know, problems in the treasurer's office. So we have a terrific trust department that is world-class. We're the custodian for all the pension systems. That's $300 billion. It's a lot of money. Uh, we manage a $30 billion portfolio in our investment desk. We access the capital markets, so we issue debt. We go into the capital markets. Lisa Eisenberg, I would put Lisa as one of the top 10 public finance uh, managers in the state of Ohio, and she works with us in our debt department and is a terrific manager. We just have, you know, our cash management. We, um, you know, obviously we collect about you know, $90 billion of taxpayer money a year, and then we disperse about the same amount every year. And our treasury department does that. Our accounting department reconciles the books each and every day to the penny. So all those things that maybe make your eyes roll into the, into the back of your head, but that is what it takes to fulfill our good stewardship mission. Um, in terms of, I will just say in September, one of the things that we're talking a lot about is our bold innovation piece of our mission. And this is our Results Ohio program. Uh, when I was in the General Assembly, I worked a lot on the heroin issue. And I don't know if any of you have done work on the heroin issue. Uh, maybe you're in the treatment area. Maybe you help families. Maybe um, you've seen what it costs some of our families in terms of uh, their loved ones being addicted to heroin, but I was met with that each and every day as a state legislator. And when I got into the treasurer's office, I said, I want to be able to create a program 
that allows communities to solve problems at the local level and allow them to try new ideas that takes care of these problems for the state of Ohio. And so when I got into the treasurer's office, we launched a new program called Results Ohio. And the reason we call it Results Ohio is because we only pay for the things that produce results. So the first project that we ran is a, a project down in Appalachia, Ohio. I don't know if anybody here from Appalachia. Uh, so you know that it takes a long time just to travel from one county to the next. And in some cases, some of the communities in Appalachia are not blessed with the number of doctors that you have here in downtown Columbus, where everybody wants to live because they want to be part of the Ohio State University. And so the kids in Appalachia, if you have to drive for an hour to get a doctor's appointment, in many cases, those kids don't get all the medical care that they need. And in one instance, they don't get eyeglasses. They don't go to the optometrist. And so the foundation for Appalachia, Ohio said, we're going to put up $1.3 million of private philanthropic dollars to try a pilot program that instead of having the child go to the doctor, we're going to bring the doctor to the child in terms of a mobile clinic. And we're going to run it in 13 different counties in Appalachia. And we said, great, let's define what success looks like up front, and then we'll hire the University of Cincinnati to come in and measure whether or not the pilot project was successful. So let me share with you the results of the project. 4,000 kids went through this mobile clinic. I personally went down there, Todd, and I, my staff like whisked me into Vinton Middle School there. And they're like, hey, Robert, why don't you help this young lady, fifth grader, little girl that came off the mobile vision clinic, just had the eye appointment with the optometrist. She needs to pick out some eyeglasses. I'm like, great, I've got a fifth grader too, a fifth grade little girl. I'm like, I know it's the pink and purple over here. Let's pick out some pink and purple eyeglasses. And she's trying to figure out how to tell the treasurer that she doesn't want pink and purple eyeglasses. <laughs> so she goes down to the other end of the table and she picks out these bright blue eyeglasses with black speckles. Um, and I'm holding the mirror up and she looks at herself in the mirror and huge smile from ear to ear with those eyeglasses. And I thought to myself, this is a great program to be a part of. And she walks off and the optometrist catches me by the sleeve and he said, Robert, he said, I want you to know something about this little girl. I don't think she's ever had an eye exam in her life. I said, well, how can you tell that by giving her an eye exam? He said, because she really can't see out of her right eye. She has a stigma in her right eye. And any optometrist that would have given her an eye exam, she'd be wearing eyeglasses in fifth grade right now. And so the reason that that little girl got eyeglasses was because this project was not going to pay unless those metrics were achieved. And she got eyeglasses that day. Uh, we had 4,000 kids that went through this pilot project. 95% of the kids that needed eye exams received eye exams at this mobile clinic. 100%. 100% of the kids that they, they determined needed eyeglasses from the eye exam actually received eyeglasses from the mobile clinic. So it was a tremendous success. And here's the thing that we didn't even know about that we weren't planning on. 900 of those children actually had a serious eye condition that then were referred to an ophthalmologist or an optometrist to take care of that more serious eye condition. So because of the fantastic results, we said we're going to pay the $1.3 million dollars. So the Foundation for Appalachia, Ohio got that $1.3 million back. And you know what they're going to do with it? Invest in the next project to help kids in Appalachia. So um, we're really proud of that project. It turned out great. And it's our kind of uh, uh, initial project out of the Results Ohio program. Well, let's move into kind of the theme of this forum in terms of politics. Let's get a little bit into politics in your office here. A uh, bill that passed the Senate in May would ban the state's five public pension funds from environmental, social, and governance projects, or ESG investment strategies. Now, you said on Twitter, quote, ESG is a politically correct tool to advance a radical agenda masquerading as social responsibility. It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Investors and policymakers need to wake up to the reality that ESG policies are not only misguided, but extremely dangerous for our economy. Now, supporters say those policies actually encourage companies to act responsibly. Why do you disagree? Uh, well, I think that, you know, in the treasurer's office, we have a responsibility to the taxpayer. Uh, and our responsibility is, number one, to make sure that the principal is returned for each and every one of our investments. Number two, we want to make sure that you, as a taxpayer, get a good rate of return on that investment. And number three, we want to make sure that we are taking care of the liquidity needs of the state. 
In other words, when there's cash that is needed to pay a bill on Friday, that that cash is there for the state of Ohio. So in the treasurer's office, we said, look, we're not going to make investments based on ESG criteria. We're going to make investments based on safety of principle, rate of return, and the liquidity needs of the state of Ohio, not a personal agenda and not an ideological agenda. Uh, we feel like that fulfills our good stewardship mission for the office, uh, and we think that that's the right thing to do with our portfolio. You've also had harsh words for the boycott, divestment, and sanctions, or BDS movement. Supporters of BDS say it's designed to pressure Israel into ending what they say is an occupation of Palestine. The Treasurer's Office has purchased $217.5 million in Israel bonds since you took office. Just yesterday, you announced $5 million purchase. Isn't that an ideological investment strategy? Well, I'll tell you, the treasurer's office has been purchasing Israel bonds for about 30 years. So both Democrats and Republican treasurers have purchased Israel bonds since Mary Ellen Withrow. Um, we do have a sizable investment in Israel bonds. We have continued that. And one of the reasons, that the, the only reason that we continue that is not an ideological or a personal effort to invest in Israel bonds, but rather they are a key piece of our portfolio. Liquidity bonds provide uh, a nice liquidity premium in terms of our risk-adjusted returns to our portfolio. They also help with the duration, the long-term duration of our portfolio and the way that our long-term portfolio is constructed for the $30 billion uh, assets that we have. Uh, and they just provide a great investment tool. So, and we've always been clear about that, that the reason that we invest in Israel bonds is because they are a great investment for the state of Ohio. They fit our uh, portfolio for our, our aperture for our portfolio, and they provide a great return for the taxpayers of the state of Ohio. Um, we want to try to keep politics out of investing and in the way we manage our portfolio. Back on the pension funds, are you at all concerned about the five pension funds and the strength of the system, especially the state teachers' retirement system? Uh, there have been some serious questions about investment strategy and transparency in that particular uh, pension fund from retired teachers who up until this year had not gotten a cost of living adjustment since 2017. Are you concerned about the health of Ohio's pension funds? Um, absolutely, I'm concerned about the health. I think it's tremendously important. I think they, you know, obviously they need to focus on their mission and their number one mission. And for any of our appointees, I tell them this, your number one mission when you get on that board is to make sure that that pension is there for that pensioner. You know, they have devoted their lives to public service, either in our schools or on the front lines of the fire department or trying to keep our community safe as a police officer. Um, you need to make sure that that pension is there for that pensioner when they retire. Uh, that being said, the treasurer's office, we are actually prohibited in the Ohio Revised Code uh, from uh, making any investment recommendation as to how to invest the money of the pension funds. So we are the custodian, which means that we just make sure that if the state teacher's retirement fund buys a building as part of their investment portfolio, that the building actually exists and it's in the custody of the state teacher's retirement fund uh, and that all the documents are in order. So we're the custodian. We are prohibited by uh, law from uh, influencing or directing the pension fund's investment. That's the responsibility of the board of each pension fund. Let's talk a little bit about issue one last month and issue one two months from now. So along with nearly all Republican state office holders, you supported issue one last month. That's the one that would have raised the voter approval threshold to pass constitutional amendments, future amendments by to 60 percent. Why did you support that? Why, do you, there are people who will tell you it's not easy to amend the Constitution. Why, why did you support that? Uh, I supported that because in the legislature as a lawmaker, uh, it takes 50% in order to pass a law in the state of Ohio. I always felt that our founding document, the Ohio Constitution, should require a greater threshold to be able to amend the Ohio Constitution. Uh, that was my view on it, but obviously the people of the state of Ohio wanted to keep the 50% threshold and be able to change the Constitution at a much lower threshold. Um, I think it's really important as you look at these issues that you respect the will of the people. It's their Constitution. Uh, so I was, I was part of the group that thought there needed to be a higher threshold, but I intend to respect the will of the people of the state of Ohio, and we're going to move on from there. 
And moving on to November, we have another issue one. This one would guarantee abortion rights and reproductive rights in Ohio's constitution. You tweeted, quote, parental rights are on the ballot this November. Well, there's actually nothing in the language about parental rights, but of course there's the possibility of litigation if it passes for that issue to be talked about in court. That message didn't work in Michigan where a similar amendment did pass last year. Do you think that message is gonna work in Ohio? I don't know about what message is gonna work in Ohio. Uh, what I will tell you is that, you know, I have five children, I'm pro-life. If you look at my voting record, I've always been pro-life. So I'm gonna be voting in November against that uh, amendment to the Ohio Constitution. Uh, what I'm concerned about, I guess, in terms of my rights as a parent is I don't want the government to come between me and my children and put you know, a counselor or a doctor to help my child make a life-changing decision. I would like for the Ohio Constitution to respect uh, our family and my ability to help counsel and guide and make decisions with my children over what's right and good for them with any of their medical care. Um, so I think those are my concerns about the uh, parental rights piece. And, you know, what's interesting, I was just reading an article, I don't know if you all saw this, in the uh, Cleveland Plain Dealer yesterday. And it was like five questions that are kind of unanswered about this constitutional amendment. And I think there's a lot of confusion over what is going to be the effect of this constitutional amendment on families and how is that gonna affect parental rights in the state of Ohio. And I guess my opinion is if you're gonna amend the highest governing document of the state, there should be very clear what that amendment does and how it affects parents in the state of Ohio. Um, I want Ohio to be a great place for people to raise their family and I think that this, is, this, this issue is very important. If you support parental rights, are you then, what are your thoughts on the bill that would ban gender affirming care for minors? That would, when parents want to have that gender affirming care, the state would take it away essentially. Um, I don't know. I haven't thought a lot about gender affirming care for minors. Um, I'd have to think more about that. Well, let's talk about issue two then. That's the marijuana legalization amendment. The group that put that on the ballot is the Coalition to Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol, which they say is pretty self-explanatory. What are your thoughts on the legalization of marijuana? Because it would be taxed. In this amendment, it would be a 10% tax. So there's a treasurer's office connection oh, there. Well, then I'm in favor of it, obviously. <laughs> I mean, if we're going to tax it, uh, well, I mean, how could I be against that? Uh, I'll tell you, you know, I think, you know, have, having five kids and also having teenagers in my house, in uh, doing the work that I did on the heroin issue, I saw parents, as a matter of fact, I remember going down to Scioto County and talking with uh, a group of kids that were um, struggling with a, an addiction to heroin. And I remember I asked them, I said, well, how did, how did you get into this? And she said, well, um, she said we were driving around with our friends. And then we were driving around with our friends and we would get a 12 pack of beer and we would split it up among everybody and drive around and drink in the car. And then it didn't seem like that much of a, of a jump to smoke a joint while we were driving around in the car together. And then when somebody brought pills, it didn't seem like that big of a deal to take a pill along with drinking a beer when we were in the car. And that's how I became addicted to heroin. I'm not saying that that's the gateway for everybody. I'm just telling you that was one person's experience in Scioto County when I was in the legislature. Th that concerns me. I think that marijuana is still a gateway drug. And I think we need to be careful about what we do in terms of drug policy and how that's going to affect our, our, our children uh, and then the future of our state. Um, I can remember back when this issue was originally raised, uh, I was against it. Um, I'm gonna be against it again in November, I'm gonna vote no, simply because I would like for us, uh, once again, to make sure that we're doing the right thing for, for kids in the state of Ohio and for families. One of the downsides for Republicans in winning so much is that you get term limited out and then you have a lot of office holders who are looking at other offices that they're interested in. What are you looking at? You're term limited now. Where, where do you wanna go from here? Uh, well, right now, I'm focused on the treasurer's office. We have a lot more to do. Uh, my chief of staff is here with me today, Zach Crawford, 
and Brittany Halpin, my uh, PR, and, uh, and, and Ryan Montgomery. We've got a lot more to do in our office. I think that we can, you know, we've got a, one of the things that we're working on with the governor's office that you're gonna see come out here in January is we have a brand new account to try to help people with home purchases in the state of Ohio. And we're gonna use the power of our balance sheet through our Ohio Gains Initiative uh, to be able to help people buy a house here in Ohio. Because when you buy a house here, you invest in Ohio and you're gonna stay here. And so we're very excited about that. We've got a lot of other things uh, that are coming up. So I think over the next two years, we're gonna let this presidential cycle work its way through. We're gonna focus on our, our knitting in the treasurer's office and fulfilling our mission. And then we'll worry about that in two years. You are certainly serious about something. I mean, the rumor is governor, of course. You loaned your campaign more than $900,000 before the filing deadline. Of course, that doesn't mean you have to spend that money, but, but what are you, why did you do that? You're obviously looking at something beyond the treasurer's office. Well, I think that if you look at where our state has been over my adult lifetime, you know, so I'm from Finley, I'm from Northwest Ohio, and I was just talking with Will about this earlier. And I said, you know, the story of my part of the state is that we used to produce all the cars in the United States up in Detroit. And Northwest Ohio produced spark plugs and car parts and tires and all these things that were part of our industrial base. And you think about Youngstown, who produced the steel, right? Toledo produced the glass and so on and so forth. And over my entire adult lifetime, starting in the 1970s, 1974, uh, all that industrial production began to move to Asia and overseas. And NAFTA, yeah, we did hear the giant sucking sound <laughs> as all of our production went down to Mexico and it left, it left the state of Ohio. My view is that we are at an inflection point as a state. And I think that the inflection point is that the public policy problem that we were solving for over the last, excuse me, last 40 years was that we didn't have enough jobs for all the people in our state. Our industrial capacity was leaving. I think that the public policy issue over the next 40 years as companies move away from China and Asia to produce things. We have a new land war in Europe. People are gonna be returning production back to the United States of America. And in Ohio, we have size and we have scale and we have workforce and logistics and water that you can't replicate anywhere else in the world. And I think that the public policy problem that we're gonna be solving for in the future is not that we don't have enough jobs for all of our people, it's gonna actually be that we don't have enough people for all the jobs that are gonna to come to our state. And so I think that uh, develops a different set of problem solving skills. I think that the future is very bright for Ohio and I'm not done in talking about trying to help solve those problems and working on leading our state in that direction. In fact, Policy Matters Ohio did a report that said that there are two job openings for every job seeker in Ohio. So we're, we're at that point right now. We are, and so I think the question is, you know, how do we help people write their own story now in the state of Ohio? The jobs have come back, so now the question becomes, how do we get kids tr training in the skilled trades? How do we get kids trained in the jobs for tomorrow? How do we get them the technology training? How do we, uh, you know, we, we do a great um, program with the Ohio State University um, for our real money, real world program, which is phenomenal, and kids learn from that. You know, how do we create internships at Ohio State and co-ops at Ohio State so the kids stay here in Ohio and take those jobs at Grange Insurance or, or uh, you know, Huntington Bank or uh, the local manufacturing firm? I think that the opportunity is very bright for our state, but in many cases, just like in the treasurer's office, you know, the treasurer's office is going to do whatever the person at the head of it says the vision and the mission is. And I think that's true for the state of Ohio. And I think you wanna have policy makers that aren't just looking at what the current state is, but also looking at what the future is, because as you begin to problem solve for the, for the issues that are gonna help our state succeed in the future, I think those are the problems that we need to tackle. I'm gonna turn it over to you all for questions here in just a minute, but I wanna ask a final question here. Uh, you support former President Trump saying last month, quote, under President Trump's leadership, our nation's economy was strong, we were achieving energy independence, our allies respected us and our enemies feared us. Are you concerned about how your support of a candidate who's now been indicted four times might impact a run for higher office? 
Um, I guess the way that I look at Donald Trump versus Joe Biden is what I've seen over the last three years with President Biden, I'm sorry, two years with President Biden, is we've had a lot of inflation, which is fundamentally a spending problem from the United States government. And we talked about the downgrade from Fitch of the United States debt. I think that that's a long-term weakness and a problem for our economy and for our country. Um, I looked at what Donald Trump did, and maybe not what, I, what he always said, but I look at what he did and the state of our country under Donald Trump, and I felt like the state of the economy was strong. We were returning jobs back to the United States, uh, and our, we had a strong military, and I think that our allies trusted us and our enemies feared us. And that's the reason that I'm supporting Donald Trump for president. As a Republican, do you feel he's the best in the field that's out there? Um, I do at this point because he's a, a proven commodity and he's been able to show uh, that he's be, been able to put these policies in place. And I think that these policies have benefited Ohioans. I think they've benefited working class Ohioans. The return of this production back to the United States, uh, which he really fought for, I think that that's helped Ohio families and Ohio workers. All right. Well. It's time for questions now. Thank you very much for your answers to my questions here, but I, I wanna turn it over to you folks. It's CMC's longstanding tradition to take audience questions. Mantra Moody with CMC is curating questions from today's live stream audience. And for those of you who are here in person, please join Mantra at the microphone. Out of respect for others, please keep your questions brief and to the point so that we can get to as many as possible. And remember, questions have a question mark at the end of them. So make sure that you do that. So Mantra, what's our first question? All right, thank you, Karen. Um, U.S. regional banks have recently suffered from setbacks and several bankruptcies. Columbus is home to many of these regional banks. Do you see any reason to be concerned? I'll tell you what, I'm just so sorry that Jason Stevens couldn't be here as speaker because your forum would be so much more interesting, exciting if he were here. I'm sorry that you're getting bank liquidity questions. Uh, I, I'm just so, so sorry. Um, I think that if you look at one of the best regional banks in the United States is headquartered right here in Columbus, and it is Huntington Bank. In Huntington, if you look at the depository base, um, it is extremely diversified, unlike some of these banks that went under in California. Uh, I think that you know, it's something that we're monitoring in the treasurer's office, the, the ability for uh, our regional banks to be healthy and survive. But at this point, they're look, their depository base is looking very, very strong. Um, so we'll continue to monitor that. I'm not afraid of this economy right now for our regional banks, but um, obviously as interest rates increase, that puts a lot of, uh, pressure on the spread that, bank, that banks can earn. Uh, and we're already seeing a little bit of a slowdown in terms of business capital investment and also pe people purchasing houses because the mortgage rate is now at 7%. Now what people who are older will tell you, well, they'll say, well, Robert, I remember when the mortgage rate was 18%, right? When I tried to buy a house in 1981. So we clearly can, can be fine in terms of our banking system, but we're going to have to monitor it and uh, make, sure that, make sure that it's strong. We've done uh, a lot in, in the Treasury of actually trying to bring our Ohio tax dollars back to Ohio and put deposits at our regional banks uh, because we know that their depository base is important. Another question? I'm John Lowe. Um, do you acknowledge that Donald Trump lied about the last election and continues to lie about it and led an attempt to overthrow our government on January the 6th? Hmm. You know, I think that every American has the right to free speech. And I think that he was exercising his First Amendment right. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens with the indictments. And he'll be tried by a jury of his peers, and we'll see if these things are politically motivated or whether they stick and he uh, is convicted of, of uh, these things that you've said he's done. What do you think? Um, I'm not the elections expert. I think that's Frank LaRose and other people. I'm sure that there's never any, um, 
you know, I'm sure that everybody has their own opinion about the elections and what happened directly after the elections. Um, you know, I think that my feeling is that I think from a public policy standpoint, he's done a great job as president, but I think that some of the things that he sa says are inflammatory and I think uh, difficult. As the treasurer, you play a crucial role in overseeing Ohio's finances. How do you believe the outcomes of ballot initiatives like reproductive rights and marijuana might impact the state's fiscal outlook and budgetary considerations? Uh, I really don't think those issues are going to have a fiscal impact. So. Good afternoon, Mr. Sprague. You made an interesting and insightful comment about certain issues not being appropriate at the constitutional amendment level, but they're being discussed at the constitutional level because the general feeling is the legislature's out of touch with the majority of people in Ohio. Given that fact, I'm wondering where you stand on the uh, issue of apportionment and drawing fair maps. I'm sorry, what did, what did you say at the end there? I was wondering what your position was on the issue of reapportionment and drawing fair maps. Sorry, reapportionment. Um, you know, I think that we, we, we want to have fair districts in the state of Ohio, um, but I think it's very, it's very difficult to take politics out of drawing maps about political districts or legislative districts. And I think how you do that is extremely important. And it's very difficult. You know, we could say, well, um, you know, we could, we could take this table right here, and we can say, well, we'd like for you to draw fair districts. But there are probably people even at this table that have some political motives or political insights that they want to accomplish in the drawing of those maps. So I think that uh, at the end of the day, it's very difficult to take the politics out of drawing these maps. I think that they've, they've tried to do that, and I think that they're making progress toward doing that, but um, I think it's very difficult to take the politics out of it. Hello, Al Lorenzo. My question is about the investment strategy and the percentage of the portfolio that might be dedicated to Ohio-based businesses or even local businesses. Sure, um, we don't have a specific percentage of the portfolio that's dedicated to Ohio businesses. What we did get authorization from the General Assembly was to put a certain amount of money toward our linked deposit programs. Um, so our link deposit programs indirectly benefit some Ohio businesses. Uh, our most popular one is our AgLink program. So I don't, I doubt anybody in here is a farmer, but uh, but we have some people on our uh, on our. Are we okay? You're a farmer. All right, perfect. That's great. Well, you should take advantage of our AgLink program. <laughs> so uh, Brittany will sign you up. Um, the application window is open year round, so you can apply at any time. And if you're a farmer, typically you take out a fairly large loan to plant in February to be able to plant, pay for all the diesel and the seed and, and the Roundup and everything else that you have to buy. Uh, when you take that loan out from the bank, we can lower that percentage rate on the, on, on the loan anywhere from 1% to 4% by using our balance sheet, your taxpayer dollars, for the benefit of the people of the state of Ohio. And so uh, we're able to lower that interest rate for the loan. That's been a huge help to farmers, particularly as um, you know, inflation has driven the cost of diesel. Diesel has now doubled. Roundup is something like four times what it was before. Uh, you know, the cost for seed has gone up, and also the interest rates are up. Uh, so this interest rate reduction is a real benefit for farmers and, and farm businesses in the state of Ohio. So you can apply year-round. It's easy and we do it through with your local financial institution, whichever financial institution you use. So it's a great way for us to put our balance sheet to use for the benefit of Ohioans. Another online question? Yes. Okay. Um, ESG strategies often include efforts to promote sustainability, diversity, and ethical governance. Do you believe that businesses should refrain from such initiatives altogether or is there a particular aspect of ESG that you find problematic? Um, I think businesses are different than government. Businesses have stakeholders. And you could argue that business strategy is actually the fulfillment of stakeholder needs for a business. 
So as a private business, you have the latitude really to do whatever you want. Uh, and so you can take into account the environment. You can take into account social or governance criteria. Um, I think the, 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 the bar or the threshold is much higher for people in government uh, because we have a fiduciary obligation to the people of the state of Ohio and the treasurer's office, for instance. Um, so I think that it's different for corporations. I think the corporations are free to do what they like regarding ESG. Um, but in terms of our obligations, our obligations are different. Hi, Sarah Schrader. Um, I think that it's quite clear in Ohio and in other states in the um, U.S. now that we have a pretty clear divide between the rural and urban areas of the state in terms of political leanings. Do you agree with that? And are you concerned about that? And do you have any thoughts on how we overcome that divide in our in our state and our country? Um, I don't know. I think that we do have uh, a bit of a division between our urban areas and our rural areas. Uh, I think the key probably to closing that divide is to try to come up, first of all, with policies that, that fit uh, everyone, that allow everybody to write their own story, to pursue their own dreams. Um, and, and then I think the second piece, which is important, and you know, we did this when I was in the legislature. One of the reasons we actually, we pulled together a study committee uh, to look at the heroin issue. And it was bipartisan in nature, so it had both Democrats and Republicans on it. And we traveled around the state. And it really helped us to go to some areas, whether it was the urban area uh, inside of Cleveland. All the legislators got to go and see what was different inside of urban Cleveland. I'll never forget, um, you know, I come from a small uh, rural area, and my kids will go to the same school their entire life, or as long as we're there, or they could. Um, I remember we went to Cleveland, and we went to uh, Washington Elementary School. And the teacher there said, look, she said, I, would, this, I think it was a third grade, she said, I'd like all the kids that have come here this year to stand up. And 40% uh, of the class stands up. I mean, all those kids that arrived there that year because they were coming from one elementary school in an area of Cleveland to another one. Uh, that's just not something that you know, we're used to in a rural area. So I think that you know, having the study committee and going to see what's happening in different areas of the state makes you much more sympathetic and it makes you a better policymaker. Uh, to try to close that divide. Hi, Treasurer. Stacey Rostowskis with Ohio State. I want to thank you for mentioning the Real Money, Real World program. We've been a proud to partner with you on that. So my question is about financial literacy, and you've been working on this issue for some time. Can you give us a sense of sort of, especially in our K through 12 schools, sort of the state of financial literacy and what is we, you know, not just Ohio State, but as, as Ohioans can do I think to help with uh, with better education for our young people. Yeah, I think that you know financial literacy. So we were just talking about the rural and urban divide, and one of the things that you begin to realize as you come into urban neighborhoods is that, you know that they they are thirsty for knowledge about money and how wealth is built and how money works. Uh, OSU Extension has this phenomenal program called Real Money, Real World. When we got into the treasurer's office, everybody was like, Robert, you've got to develop a financial literacy program in the treasurer's office. And I said, look, instead of us developing something from scratch, how about we look around at people that have already done this and are doing a great job with it? And we found Real Money, Real World. And one of the things that's great about Real Money, Real World is, I don't know if any of you have had kids that go through this, but uh, the kids actually go through a simulation. So they have a job, then they figure out how many pets they want to have, what kind of car they want to drive, my son Graham ended up with four pets and I think he went bankrupt at the end of the simulation. <laughs> so, uh, but this is how you learn, right? Is through, it, it, they actually make learning fun through this Real Money, Real World program. Uh, and, and it's a great experience. So I think that in terms of where we go from here, it's, it's a tremendously important topic. Uh, and I think something that we're gonna revisit because financial literacy is not just for kids. 
It also affects adults and in particular, small business owners that with, or entrepreneurs that wanna start a business. Uh, so I think this financial literacy topic um, is really important. It's the one skill, you know, I, I tell my son Graham, like I went to Duke and I was a mechanical engineer and I never used calculus, you know? But you're gonna budget every single day of your life and you need to know how interest rate works and how credit works and how your budget works. Um, so these are life skills that we need to be teaching uh, our young people. Another online question? Yes, yeah. so, okay, do the tax cuts cuts passed by the legislature make your job as treasurer more difficult? And what does Ohio spend the most taxpayer dollars on annually? Um, I'll have to double check what uh, this latest budget in terms of the overall spending. I can tell you, uh, when I was in the legislature, I was the uh, chair of the Medicaid subcommittee, which I think was a punishment by the speaker at the time. And uh, he was like, Sprague, you're gonna craft the Medicaid budget, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, I wanted to be the budget guy, but I didn't wanna be Medicaid budget guy. But, uh, and at the time, Medicaid was the largest expense uh, of the state of Ohio, um, followed closely by K through 12 education, and then higher education, uh, and then by the prison system and the criminal justice system in the state of Ohio. So those are the, the three things uh, that we spend money on in the state. And uh, they're all important and they're all critical and we spend a lot of money on Medicaid. I have a question while we're waiting for another online sure. question here. A lot of people have gotten their property tax bills from the county treasurer's offices. Mm -hmm. And those estimates have been blowing people's minds. You've got some of those values going up 40%. Mm -hmm. Does your office have anything to do no, with it? No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> we are not responsible for your property tax bills. Um, I, I think, uh, I, you, you know, I would be surprised if there's not some legislators and legislation that's going to be introduced on this just because of the dramatic um, increase in price of home values. It's not much fun when you're on a fixed income to see your property taxes go up by 30%. And that's a real stress on every family in the state of Ohio, but particularly working families in the state of Ohio and our elderly that lived on fixed incomes. And I, and I don't think that's good. Um, and we need, to, we need to pay attention to that because this really affects families. Um, and I think that, I, I hope that you'll see uh, legislators looking at this. Um, it does not affect the, the revenues of the state. It's a, it's a, a county level, um, tax. All right. And I think this is the last question. All right. In an era of heightened political polarization, how can Ohio work towards fostering constructive dialogue and collaboration between its residents and elected officials? Um, I think that one of the things that uh, we need to do a better job at in our political environment is defining what problem we're solving for. I see so many things that are, that are, that are talked about in politics that I feel like don't solve a problem. And I think if we're gonna be successful in the future of our state, you know, we need to solve for, for three overarching problems. I think the first is we want people to build their products here. That is who we have always been as a state and as a people. And I think Intel is the latest iteration of that. So come and build your products here. That's the future of our state. I think the second piece is build your family here. Come to our state because we're a great place to raise a family at a very low cost. We have a great educational system. Your kids can get a great education uh, and we have common sense values and a lot of great opportunities for kids in our state. And then I think the third piece of that, which is critical is build your career here in Ohio. Um, as I said before, I think that we wanna provide people an opportunity to write their own story um, and we need to make sure our educational system fits their needs and really empowers people to be able to write their own story here in the state of Ohio. So I think that we want to be a place where you build things. We want to be a place where you can raise a great family. and We want to be a place where you can build a great career. Outstanding pinch hitting here for the speaker. <laughs> well, this is really, really and very you. interesting. Thank you very thank much you. for being here. Thank you.
Okay, well, uh, everyone, I hope you found today's forum very interesting. Uh, I did want to correct one misconception. If there is a crowd in Columbus that would accept a question about bank liquidity, it is the CMC, <laughs> right? You are among your people here. Uh, let's thank today's sponsor, Carlisle Patchen and Murphy, once again. Thank you to the Grange Insurance Audubon Center for hosting us one last time. I did have one new member that we didn't mention it uh, before. It's Jeff Anthony with Performance Columbus. Jeff, give us a wave. I think you're in the audience. Uh, welcome. I hope you come back. Thank you to our virtual seat patrons at the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for supporting today's live stream and a very special appreciation for today's speaker, Robert Sprague, and our host, Karen Kassler. Please play, make plans now to attend next week's forum, Gravitational Poll, How Creative Culture Makes Neighborhoods Great. This is a one-on-one -on -one with developer Brett Kaufman at our new venue in Italian Village, the Ellis. And also, please take a moment to answer the short survey you'll find on the website. We cannot do this without you. Thank you for joining us, and have a great afternoon.